Good evening. Good, we got a responsive crowd. Good, I like this section right here. It's fine. Thanks for coming out. Welcome to the Hilton El Conquistador. Thanks for uh, spending your evening with us. Uh, you're joining a whole group of uh, LSST project members and community members interested in LSST this week. Uh, we're meeting the whole week here at the, at the resort and we're really happy to be able to do this evening and have you participate. Um, and we look forward to engaging with you even after the, uh, after the talk if you're interested in sticking around. So my name is Victor Krabendam. I am the project manager for LSST. I'm going to start us off with uh, just a quick rundown on the status of LSST as it is today, the construction. Um, it will be very hard to compress that into 15 minutes. And so I might, you might find me going a little faster. I'm happy to talk to you afterwards and I'll point out a few resources in a few minutes. But first, before I start off with those kinds of uh, status ideas, uh, I wanted to just remind us all of what is LSST. LSST stands for the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope. Our objective is to build an observing facility and then conduct a 10-year survey as well as process all the images that we take archive all those images and then serve the, both the raw images and the products that we can generate from those images. So that's our objective and we'll, and we'll reach that objective by building a new eight and a half meter class telescope, a huge camera that goes on that telescope and a petascale data management system to be able to deal with the 20 odd terabytes of data that we produce every single night. That single survey that we will conduct for 10 years is, an, is designed to meet several different objectives. In the image uh, on the right, you'll see a sort of accelerated animation of what the telescope will be doing every single night. Spends 30 seconds in any particular part of the sky and then moves on to the next one for two more images. And we take something like 5 million images in those 10 years and we'll do that in any number of, any one of six filters, different optical bands and filters that we, that we have available in the camera. And then those data products that I talked about come in a different kinds, in, in a few different scales of time. So we take two 15 second images, we can do some differencing and some adding. And so we have sort of in 60 seconds, anything that's different between those will produce an alert. That's one of our data products. Also, every year or so, we will take all the data we've taken to date and reprocess it and make new catalogs and make generated uh, data products. So those are the, the general idea for how we will conduct LSST uh, after we finish construction. So to do this, we have a combination of federal funds and we had some very generous early private funding. So we have $473 million coming from the National Science Foundation and $168 million coming from the Department of Energy. The Department of Energy is very focused on just uh, building that camera that I mentioned and I'll, I'll repeat in a few minutes. And then early on, before we were fully funded by the federal government, we had 40 precious million dollars to start us off uh, to, to get the, the whole project started and really accelerate us. Uh, into the into the, the project that we became under federal funds. LSST is is a project that is vast. It is um, a, on a global scale. We have we have project members all over the globe, um, and those project members are both uh, within the sort of managing organizations, but also in partner organizations. As you can see from the next few slides, dark blue is partners. Uh, the few managing organizations are in lighter, or lighter colors. And by subsystem, you, know, you can sort of see the distribution of how we've developed the, the program using all of those resources that we could, that we could get uh, on the global scale. So here's data management. Um, the camera was developed by a, a, a rough, roughly half um, from D uh, Department of Energy Labs uh, in the light blue, and then uh, about just as many private uh, Con uh, contractors. And then the telescope and site was built heavily from uh, private contractors, uh, just it, taking advantage of, of, of the industry capabilities ac across the globe. And then EPO is also uh, being executed, also looking for who's got the expertise in the kinds of things we want to do to bring LSST, uh, not just to our science community, but also to the public itself. 
So here's an image taken just the other day. I mentioned to you that we are here in force uh, this week, this 300 or so people uh, that have, got, have come together. We've been doing this for about nine years as a collaboration meeting to bring the entire team together for both the construction, but again, now also very focused on getting ready for this, this onslaught of data and making sure that our, that our scientists are ready to take advantage of LSST when it does come online. So again, I mentioned that we're going really fast uh, tonight, uh, I will point out to you that online we have many of these, in fact, tonight will be recorded and available to you, uh, but also in previous years, uh, the talks that we've given are also available on YouTube uh, and available uh, for um, pleasure, pleasure listening and, and watching at your, in, in your own home. So uh, in about the 2012 timeframe, we were predominantly just ideas and designs, as you can see from the lower right image. That's an image of our summit facility uh, as, we as we predicted it would look and as we were designing it. Uh, on the top left is a current image as of June. And so when we started construction in 2014 with those federal funds, the five years of, or so have gotten us to the point you can see there on the summit. And as of today, uh, it looks pretty similar to what it did in June, uh, but here's just to point out that you can also follow our progress on this public webcam uh, that's available every day uh, to see the progress as it, as it progresses in Chile. So uh, if you saw the images in some of the videos at the, at the uh, beginning of the, of the evening here, uh, you saw a lot of mirrors, uh, a lot of mirror uh, video. This is a picture of our primary mirror. It's particularly unique because it has both the primary reflective surface, that's the first reflection, as well as the third reflection. That's why you see two very distinct shapes. And this is the first time at this scale anybody has ever put two optical surfaces into one piece of glass of this size. This was done right here at the University of Arizona. Um, and what we then had to do was take that 17 tons of glass and turn it into an actual mirror. It, does, it takes more than just glass. And so over the last several years, we've been spending a lot of time building the, the 30 tons or so of steel structure and mechanics that is required to hold up that mirror to the kind of tolerances that are required to make it uh, successful as an optical uh, collecting aperture. Uh, also, what you saw, this is a still image you saw in the images. We, we had the opportunity just in January of this year to put all of those pieces back together again with the glass, seeing those, uh, the structure that supports it for the first time. Uh, we had the opportunity to do that here in a laboratory, which we don't often get, uh, so that we could do some really high fidelity testing uh, of the glass, making sure that we could control it properly with, these, with this new hardware. And after that very successful testing in January, we started the long road from Tucson to Chile. And you can see here that it's not just a slow road, slow drive to Houston, uh, but it's also particularly longer because you don't get to go in a straight line when you're driving with something that big. <clears throat> you do eventually get to the port, but you also don't get to pick the weather. And between here and Texas, you can confront almost anything. You do eventually get to a port in Houston, and things go a lot smoother when you, once you get on a ship, but if you're familiar with what it takes to go from the port in Chile to our mountaintop, we also do have to go through one particular tunnel. <clears throat> I'm happy to report that. It did fit, and it worked out smoothly, and the mirror made it fine to the summit. Also going through that tunnel was the massive vacuum facility that it takes to make a coating facility. Uh, and so that chamber there on the left was also assembled. Uh, that is a picture of the coating plant in our facility on the summit um, and was recently completed, as I said, uh, but also uh, had to do that same journey, except even further because it came from Germany, um, but also successfully made it through the tunnel and was successfully executed our first coating. Uh, we happened to have our secondary mirror already on the summit, and so once that coating facility was purchased or brought off from our vendor, uh, we immediately turned around, got our team prepped, and put, the coating, uh, put our secondary mirror here that you can see in the bottom uh, into that chamber to put a uh, silver coating that's actually protected silver coating. Um, on the top left are a couple images. Also, you would have seen in the video uh, so that rotating, ma the rotating magnetrons, that was the coating facility, the coating chamber doing the actual coating of that mirror. 
So if you envision the, the optics that we have, the, in, the fore, in the background is the M1, M3 uh, mirror, in the foreground is the, is the secondary mirror with its back to us, and then the camera is in the middle. Now we have to take those optics and cameras and hold them. And so that's what we call a telescope. And so this is the rendering of that telescope. It's particularly difficult because of the cadence that we have to run with our survey. It, it requires an extremely stiff structure because we have to hold those elements in place but also be ready to move from position to position to position all night long very rapidly and not waste any time in dampening out the system. Happy to say that that whole telescope was assembled in, in Spain. Here's an image of it in its testing uh, or a video of it in, during its testing and was completed. Uh, here's an image of it in the test facility in Spain with the uh, large number of dedicated staff that it took to fabricate all of that part, all those parts, and assemble it uh, before we disassembled, have it put it on a ship, and as we speak, is uh, traversing, I believe, on the Atlantic, uh, scheduled to be in Chile uh, in the first week of September. As I said, we have a very unique and a very large camera that's necessary to collect all the light that we can gather from those optics. This particular camera has a front lens of 1.6 meters. That's 5.5 feet, five and a half feet, so if it were laying here, it would be up to about here. Um, it's about three tons, carries five of those six filters that I mentioned that we'll be taking images in. And the sixth one sits on the outside and we can, end, we can put it in during the day. At the heart of that camera is, of course, the focal plane. That's what collects actually the light. And what we do with that is we've built up that focal plane uh, to get to the 3.2 billion pixels. We do that with 189 individual, about one inch by one inch, 4,000 pixel by 4,000 pixel sensors. And so circled there, sort of in the middle of the screen, is one of those sensors. We take one sensor, pack it in with eight others to make a raft and we have 21 of those rasps to make the entire focal plane. That focal plane is about a manhole cover, 63 centimeters in diameter. And the lower right is one of those rafts. They're so closely packed together, that's actually nine sensors in that bottom image to the right. You can barely tell the difference between one sensor and the next. Happy to report that all the sensors we need, plus many extras, the engineering grade sensors, but also, the, the, but most importantly, those 189 science sensors um, are delivered by our two vendors, one of which was right here at the University of Arizona as well. We've taken all of those delivered sensors and made all of the rafts. And so progress is, pr is progressing very well with the camera. And here is the, an image uh, in the integration hall of the camera facility. In the top left is the empty camera, looking just into the face of it without the optics. And then the images on the, on the lower right, uh, successively down, is the start of the integration, the installation of those rafts that will start to become that fully uh, populated focal plane. The optics I mentioned were 1.6 meters in diameter. Those are massive. Those are some of the largest lenses we would build for, an, uh, for a camera. Um, and happy to report that those were also completed. In fact, they were completed right here in Arizona as well and were delivered today to the facility in, Cam in, in, Cal in uh, California where they will made up with the sensors and the whole camera will start to be assembled um, at, the f at the facility at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. Okay, so that's sort of a quick blitz of, of, the, of the observing structure, the observing system, and then of course there's that data system that we need. And I just wanted to pr quickly point out that we have prepared all of the network agreements necessary to move all of that data from our mountaintop in Chile in South America to our large fa data facility in, in the continental US through the networks required to move about 100 gigabits per second on a protected network. Uh, so that we can get all of that image data to the, sum, to the, to the facility um, as rapidly as possible so we can just keep up with all the data that we're taking. And as well as the networks, of course, it takes an enormous amount of computing power that is also in the process of being assembled uh, with the large amount of uh, software that is also necessary to take each raw image and, for example, take that raw image and make it a calibrated image and then turn that calibrated image into something that we can serve to the public or start to process and make those data products. 
Uh, last year, in this at this time and in in for the talk, we focused a lot on our education and public outreach program. We wanted to make sure that this large, brand new facility producing this very unique data set was immediately able to not just serve our professional scientists, but also was ready to serve the general public. And so we made sure that we embedded into the construction project a uh, part and a group that would focus specifically on how to bring the data uh, and the science to our, our public audience. And that includes working with formal education uh, groups. And so in the top left, you see one example of a formal education type program that's already been uh, demoed and tested with some, with some various groups, uh, as well as other audiences like the top right, which is the planetariums, is another place for us to outreach to, to the community. And so we're also already working on assets that can go into those formats and be available for planetariums, as well as making sure that we aren't just serving our English-speaking um, communities, but particularly because we're in Chile, we wanted to make sure that we emphasize our Spanish-speaking um, uh, community as well. And so we're working a lot on making sure that it translates well, not just in language, but in principle and in concept and culturally. So all of this is, continues to be on, on track, on schedule. I mentioned we started in 2014 and uh, we are on track to have our first light in 2021 and we'll be on sky uh, observing starting our 10 year survey starting in 2022. So that is LSST construction. When we're done, I'm happy to take questions. But in the meantime, I will pass the baton and we'll go from construction to science. Good evening. Um, Thank you for that lovely introduction to LSST. Tonight's lecture is about LSST and black holes. As we are gearing up towards the exciting results from LSST, we are also doing other things um, to, under to increase our understanding of black holes. For example, this past year, the Event Horizon Telescope released the first image of a black hole. And I was heavily involved in that project. So I want to tell you a little bit about how that project came about, and you will see a lot of parallels with what you just heard about LSST. Constructing telescopes that are specific to our goals, the large data volume, the international and large collaborations that are needed to, to get us there. But before that, let me start with, what is a black hole? We talk a lot about them. We know or claim that they exist in our universe, within our galaxy and in other galaxies. So black holes are a very natural prediction of Einstein's theory of general relativity. How gravity works was revolu revolutionized by Einstein. He wrote down his famous equations, and even though he himself never believed it, he hated the idea that his own theory predicted the existence of these infinities, these extreme objects in the universe that are basically cut off from the rest of the the rest of the communicable universe. So he hated them, but other people developed the idea that there are going to be these, w when you bend space and time, there are going to be these regions that actually are so massive and so compact that they're going to absorb all the light around them, all the mass around them, and they're going to be um, just these black objects that uh, a, um, an observer can't see. So, to illustrate that, I have a little animation here. According to Einstein's um, theory of gravity, both light and matter travel in straight paths, just like this, in the absence of a, an object that bends the space-time. But let's now put an object. What I made here is a black hole. So light and matter are still going to follow their paths on this now stretched fabric. They don't know any better. It's like ants walking on a watermelon, they don't think they're walking on something curved. Just because the sheet is curved, light and matter doesn't know any better. But what happens is that this curvature is so extreme that some of the light gets trapped in it. As you can see in the this, in this simulation, some of the light that comes too close to the black hole never makes it back out. So 
Let's go from the animation to actual computer simulations that we use to understand black hole environments and to guide our observations. So what I will show you here is some of the earliest large-scale simulations we have done here at the University of Arizona using a technology called GPUs, Graphics Processors Units. They're actually available everywhere. They're on your computer, they're on your phone. But what we did was start using them to solve equations. So instead of just having it be a graphics display on your, um, on your phone, we started doing this. So here my colleague C.K. Chan at the University of Arizona is demonstrating how, how fast we can render these, how we can run and render these simulations. He's initializing the simulation using his hands, and this, this device is called Leap Motion, just so he can control many thousand lines of code just by waving his hands and he can run the simulation forward and backward with a black hole at the center, millions of light particles going towards it, and what you see is that a lot of them get deflected and leave a hole at the center. So our prediction is that if we could take a picture of a black hole, there would be a black hole at the center of that picture. It would swallow some of the surrounding light that comes from all this gas swirling around it and leave this hole. Okay, so we had to start by picking a target. We said, okay, of all the black holes that we suspect are present around us, where should we look if we're going to take this picture and see if this hole that we predict according to these simulations is it really there? So we picked not the, the black hole at the center of our own galaxy as our first target, but we picked one, a near, relatively nearby galaxy called M87. So how you, how you can find it in the sky is, you go to the Virgo cluster, here are the arms of the Virgin, so it's somewhere here. Let's zoom in, these are all real images. And M87, is in this Virgo cluster of galaxies, not the most massive one, but the brightest one of that, of that cluster. It's sitting right here. So tonight, if you'd like, you can go out and look at where M87 is. Let's keep zooming in. So what do we know about M87? We know that when we look at the very center, the heart of that galaxy, something interesting happens. We've known about this for about 100 years. There is a what we call a jet, an outflow of energy and matter that is traced back to that, the very heart of that galaxy. The only objects we know of in the universe that are uh, capable of launching such powerful jets are black holes. So we've, we've suspected for a long time that there must be something very powerful, very massive, and acting like a black hole there. So, I said we carefully picked our targets because, you know, we want to take a picture. And the bigger the picture, the more detail we can see. Well, how big is it? I'll give you an idea. What is this? The moon. How big is the moon? Half a degree, right? If I, at arm's length, one finger width is a degree in the sky. Okay. So we start with that. We divide it into... 60 arc minutes. Just like we divide an hour into, into minutes, we divide a degree into 60 arc minutes. We take that, and each one of them we divide into 60 arc seconds. We take that, and each arc second is a thousand milli arc seconds. And we take that, and that is a thousand micro arc seconds. If our theory is correct, the image that we're going after to photograph, the black hole that we're going after to photograph, is about 40 micro arc seconds across, okay? So just think about how tiny, tiny an angular size that is in the sky. Now, we have, so the, the equivalent of putting a donut on the moon and then saying, take a picture of that from, from the Earth, okay? That's what we are after. Slightly crazy, but you know, some projects need to be crazy. So, the resolving power of a telescope goes with its diameter. Here is a fancy backyard telescope. Here is the beautiful LSST that we've just seen the construction of that is going to be revolutionizing 
And here is uh, um, another project that the University of Arizona is leading. It's being polished in the mirror lab, the giant uh, Magellan telescope. Now, these are not only enough to resolve that scale that we want to see, they're also not the right wavelength. We want to go to slightly longer wavelengths towards radio to a millimeter wave, and we want to build something that is simply the size of the Earth. Okay? Not, not any bigger. So, just like LSSD, we went to the NSF and we said, could you give us money to build an Earth-sized telescope? And they said no. <laughs> but the good news is that we are actually kind of smart and we can sometimes outsmart nature. If we can't build a dish that is as big as the Earth in order to resolve that tiny scale, we can pretend that our telescope is that big by putting telescopes all across the globe, for example, one here and one here, looking at our black hole at the same time and recording the data faithfully so that after the fact, we can take them, put them on a correlator, match up the light that they have seen, and the collecting power won't be like the, the entire Earth, but the resolving power will be like the entire Earth. This is a technique called interferometry. It has been developed over decades. So we said, okay, let's go ahead and do this. So over the past decade, we've built what is known as the Event Horizon Telescope Network. Here is a virtual tour that um, starts off in Spain, the IRM 30-meter telescope on the Pyrenees, um, in South America, the, in uh, Atacama Desert, the ALMA telescope and the Ap Apex telescope, closer home in Mexico, LMT, and right here, our submillimeter telescope in Arizona, um, to Hawaii, two, two telescope, J telescopes, JCMT and SMA, and our farthest one, just because we want the largest aperture possible, the one in the South Pole telescope. For about a decade, we outfitted all of these telescopes. We put masers on them, we put data recording devices on them, and we put receivers on them. So this, as of 2017, when we did the first worldwide observations, this was the setup of the Event Horizon Telescope Array. And in the meantime, the collaboration has also grown. This is from a meeting in late 2018 in Nijmegen. And this is our University of Arizona team undergraduates, graduates, postdocs, several faculty members, we are fully vested in making this happen. And just because we are, we are a proud group, um, again, here this is Mount Graham um, that we operate and outfit, and this is the South Pole Telescope that we outfitted and operated for the purposes of the EHD, Event Horizon Telescope, even though it's a University of Chicago telescope. In April of 2017, all of these telescopes simultaneously turned their gaze to the black holes that we picked in the sky, the one at the center of M87, as well as the one at the center of our galaxy. But I'm, I'm go not going to talk, uh, give you the results of that tonight. Happy faces, it means it was good weather everywhere. We, we obtained five beautiful nights of observations, lots and lots of data. Well, how much data? A lot of data. And this is the control center in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I'm right here. And we started trying to combine and analyze these data. So these are the locations of the telescopes that I already showed you. These are the two correlator centers where the signals are going to be combined into one. This is in Bonn, Germany, and this is MIT Haystack Observatory. So, we took five petabytes of data over the course of five nights. It is even a higher data rate than LSSD, but what saves us is that we observe for a little while and then we stop and then spend a year analyzing it, okay? As opposed to LSSD where the data is going to just keep on coming night after night. And then um, we um, sent the data the correlated data to all of these places um, where we analyzed it, fit our models to it. So five terabytes were transferred to the uh, Google Cloud across, and um, finally uh, we 
uh, released our results. So the timeline was April of 2017, the um, EHDRA. The amount of data weighed more than half a ton in disks. It is so much that um, transferring it over the, the available speed on the internet, not just from the South Pole, but anywhere, would have taken years. So we physically shipped them. We put them in crates, and then we put them on FedEx trucks, and <laughs> we had to wait for the South Pole summer to come and physically ship these crates out. And for the most part, they made it OK. Then we correlated them, um, which reduced the data by a factor of 1,000. Then we went through a process called fringe fitting, basically fitting the exact form of light that gave rise to that, that reduced it by another factor of 10,000. Then we put our imaging algorithms to use. And then finally, this is the picture you may have seen, and we had our announcement in April of 2019. This is it. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, it was even more amazing than we expected, even though we, I said, there should be some light around it that escapes, and there should be a black hole at the center. When you actually see it, it's something else. And um, we were very happy that everybody else thought that <laughs> after all of the sleepless nights and uh, a decade of work. So um, these are all the major newspapers the next day. But honestly, my absolute favorite was not the newspaper coverage. It was the memes that people came up with. <laughs> Here it is, my favorite. <laughs> and I fully take responsibility for this because we said the size of a donut on the moon so many times <laughs> that once we had the image, yes, what can you do? It, lo it looks like a half-eaten donut. So I already showed you in the beginning some simulations that we did based on Einstein's theory of general relativity, just to understand what black hole environments are like. And I showed you that animation of just shooting light rays. But that's not where it stops, really. We still have to understand how black holes get gas from their environments. Right? There are going to be stars. There is going to be gas around it. It's going to swirl in. We're going to make very detailed predictions of how gas gets there, how it emits light, and what part of it gets swollen by, uh, by the black hole, if we are going to understand it. So we've, we built these more sophisticated models. And here is an image gallery from the hundreds of simulations that we have run, just to make sure that what are we are predicting, what we think we are understanding, is in line with um, or, it, or it matches or doesn't match what we observe. So we, we followed all the possibilities that we could, and this is just that gallery. And because we ran so many different types of what-if scenarios, we were able to use all of those um, theoretical simulations in order to take this image and ask, OK, what is the mass of the black hole that gave rise to this image? And it turns out to be quite simple, because the, when you look at the bright parts of it and you fit a ring to it, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but I'm going to gloss over it. The size of 42 microarc seconds, that unit I introduced in the beginning, corresponds to a black hole mass of 6.5 billion times the mass of our sun. 6.5 billion times the mass of our sun. That's how massive that black hole is. Okay. And what is amazing is that we have an independent estimate of that, of that black hole's mass just by watching the stars around it move in orbits. Just well, basically Kepler's laws. Okay. So amazingly, that prediction is very close to 6.5 billion. So whether you trace stars around it or go and take an image and use your most sophisticated model to measure the a mass of the black hole, it's six and a half billion solar masses. This is just one 
aspect out of many that we, we want to understand about black holes. There are so many questions surrounding them. Anything from the very first black hole in the universe, when did it form, how big was it, how did it grow, how, how did they affect the galaxies that they resided in, to come closer home, how many black holes are there in our own galaxy, the small kinds, and anything in between that LIGO is making headways on, LSST is poised to make major discoveries on. And on that note, I would just like to turn it over to Rafaela, who's going to tell us about black holes of all sizes and what is in store for us. All right, thank you for y'all. Uh, thank you uh, for being here and thank you for having me. So uh, in the next 15 minutes, I would like uh, to take you on a tour on uh, the different black hole masses uh, that are out there. So for y'all uh, told us something about the biggest black holes that are, that are in our universe, those that are uh, millions or billion times the mass of the sun. But black holes come in a huge variety of masses all the way down to the tiny uh, little amount of mass of the sun. And we do also have expectation uh, that uh, an intermediate class of black holes should exist in between the one solar mass and the million uh, times solar masses. So these black holes have very different sizes, but they share one key ingredient, uh, which is their extreme gravity. And Ferial uh, already told us how that works. Not only that, but uh, black holes are, bl are black. But there is one way uh, that we have uh, to make black hole shines. And that one way is to feed the black hole with something. And different black holes feed on different stuff. So um, the most massive ones, like the one that Ferial just described, feed on the gas of their own galaxies. Some other times, these big black, black holes happen to eat one of those stars that wander around them. If we go down to the smallest black holes, where, well, uh, those black holes sometimes uh, come uh, with, uh, they live in a couple, they live together with a normal star. And their gravity is so strong that they just steal mass from their companion. They eat that and they shine that way. And then there is another class of black holes, the cannibals. Uh, so those are black holes that eat their own star, the star uh, that produced them. And tonight, I'd like to take you on this little tour and try to understand how we can use LSST to learn and reveal all of these types of black holes in our universe. So let's get started with the small, the small ones. So when we look up in the night skies, and here in Arizona, you have some beautiful skies, uh, we might be uh, misled and to believe that what we are looking at is peaceful beauty. Instead, what we are looking at is light that comes from a fight, a fight for survival. So those stars are shining in their attempt to fight against their own gravity. The gravity will like them to collapse. That, uh, so the stars, to, to survive, they initiate fusion equal, they produce photons, and those photons that, uh, that are those that make them shine bright are those that prevent them from, uh, from collapsing. However, at some point, fuel is over, and fuel for a star is hydrogen. So what happens is that gravity wins. Gravity always wins at the end. The, stars, the star starts to collapse, and that initial collapse is later uh, counterbalanced and becomes an explosion. Stellar explosions, also known as, super, as supernovae, are a very, uh, very common outcome for stars that are at least 10 times our own sun. So if you now go into a real picture, this is a real picture of what is left behind from a stellar explosion that happened a thousand years ago. It's the Crab Nebula, a beautiful, uh, a beautiful nebula in our, uh, in our sky. And if we zoom in, those are real images, those are not animations. If you zoom in, we can actually see what, is, what has been produced deep down there. This is a neutron star. And I will tell you in a second what a neutron star is. So bottom line, the key thing that I'd like you to take away from this slide is that if you wait a thousand years, 
we can see uh, what is produced by the explosion, what is produced deep down by the star collapsing. However, we do not see what is produced by a stellar explosion right away. And the reason is pretty simple, and here is how it works. Suppose that we have our, our big star, that big star runs out of fuel, collapses, produces a black hole in its core. That black hole is here, but in no way we can see what that black hole is producing. That black hole is accreting and eating the mass of its own star, but we can see it. Why? Because there is all of this mass uh, from the star that prevents any light from uh, coming, um, coming out. However, with time, the explosion expands, and this matter dilutes around. So at some point, what happens is that this is um, low density enough for these photons to come out. And at that point, we can see our neutron star, our black hole that was formed. So this, this is a typical normal stellar explosion. By now, I think you already understand that if, by any chance, the universe also produces explosions, stellar explosions that are born and not big with a thick blanket, so not with a, a large amount of matter around, but just a little tiny amount of matter around, well, in that case, it's way easier for the photons produced by the black hole sitting deep down to shine, and so we can see the black hole right away. So, bottom line, if those things exist, we should be able to see how black holes look like right at the time of formation. And until, uh, until June 2018, if you were to ask me, have we ever seen something like that, I would have told you, no. But things changed. Uh, on June uh, 2018. So this is really the frontier of discovery. This is where LSST is going to play a huge game. So uh, here is uh, what happened uh, in June 2018. A transient, a new transient was found in the sky. So what we do is very, very simple. We keep taking images, just like LSST would do, and then we do difference, differences. And we ask ourselves, is there something new with respect to the previous night? Yes or no? So we found uh, this new transient, and we are not very creative. We call it AT, Astronomical Transient. 2018 is the year. And then we start naming stuff with AAA, the first transient in 2018, AAB for the second one, and so on. And this poor thing just happened to be COW. <laughs> So this is uh, how uh, the following day every astronomer would be speaking like, oh, what is, uh, what is the cow doing? But that's what they mean. I mean, what is this transient doing? All right, so uh, this cow transient is exactly uh, one of these explosions that, was, uh, that only had a very tiny amount of mass around. So let me explain you what that means. So what you have here is luminosity versus time. And a normal uh, stellar explosion usually takes 20 days to reach the peak of luminosity. And it's crazy luminous. It's 10 billion times the sun. So a star, when it dies, it becomes as luminous as its entire galaxy. It's quite amazing. But here is what a cow did. So it did go to peak in two days, and it was much more luminous, like a thousand billion times the sun. And by studying the cow uh, across the entire electromagnetic spectrum with a whole fleet of NASA spacecraft, radio antennae, uh, and telescopes, including DMNT here in Arizona, we were able to understand that what was causing this weird behavior, this crazy luminosity, uh, was the birth um, of, of a black hole uh, by, uh, uh, by the collapse of this star. This is the first time we could witness uh, this phenomenon in real time. And uh, where does LSSC come into this picture? Well, these explosions are rare. So if we want to learn what black holes do right at the time of their, of their formation, we have to find more. And if you want to find more, you need big eyes. This is what LSST is going to do for us. OK, so uh, by now I told you method one. If you want to produce a black hole, uh, the first thing you can do is to make a big star explode. But I'm going to give you a few other methods, uh, a few recipes um, uh, to produce a black hole. So uh, another option that you have is take two neutron stars and make them collide. So what is a neutron star? Well, a neutron star is the most compact star we know of. It has the mass, roughly the mass of our sun, in 10 kilometers. Super compact. And neutron stars are also produced by stellar explosions, and uh, I can even point at it. Uh, this is a neutron star produced by this explosion a thousand years ago. 
So we do know how to produce one neutron star, which is uh, explode a star. So how do we go about having two? Well, uh, we start with two stars. And in, um, in nature, what happens is that the biggest stars are the ones uh, that uh, run out of fuel the earlier. And so the first big star in the system will explode. And the companion has to survive uh, bound uh, to, the, uh, to the system, which only happens in a few, uh, uh, in a very low percentage of cases. At some point, the other star will also go boom. And, at, and also the system has, again, has to survive. And if this happens, if the system is able to go through this very, uh, two these two very violent steps in their lifetime, well, then you have two neutron stars. Okay, so now you know how to produce one neutron star, we know how to produce two. So why they can't just stay there and rotate uh, around each other? Why they have to collide? The answer is simple, and it has to do with gravity again. These objects are so compact that uh, the amount of energy that they lose through gravitational waves, which is also a prediction from Einstein theory of relativity, is important. And so what happens is the following. These two neutron stars lose energy, and they start rotating faster and faster and faster, and at some point they merge. And by at the when they merge, they also produce um, a very luminous uh, transient, a very luminous um, signal in our sky that lasts for one or two weeks. So let me play this ag uh, again. So we start with two neutron stars. They can't stay there. Uh, they lose energy, and at some point they merge. When that happens, it's an extremely violent uh, event in our universe, and they produce light. So um, this is something uh, that we have actually detected. And this happens on uh, Ag August 17, 2017, almost two years ago. So uh, for the first time on that day, uh, we were able to detect gravitational waves and light from the same celestial object. This was an effort by more than 3,000 scientists around the globe, so it's a massive effort. So huge teams are involved. And not only we could find light I mean the type of light that we can see with our own eye, but we are also able to find uh, radio waves and x-rays. This is the first time we could wit witness in real time two neutron stars colliding. Producing what? A black hole. Here we go. So where does LSCT come into the game here? So the gravitational wave experiments that we have right now are fantastic, amazing, but their localization capabilities are not, uh, not as good as in the optical. So what happens, uh, what means is that when we receive an alert uh, from the gravitational wave experiment, they tell us there is something that happened around there. Go and figure out where, where that, that really happened. And inside that error circle, there are many potential galaxies, many potential locations where that neutron star merger might have happened. So what we do and what we need to do is something as uh, simple as that. We have to tile. We have to tile the field and understand is there something new that wasn't there the previous night that is most likely uh, related to the neutron star merger. So that's what we have to do. LSST has a unique combination of sensitivity, has a big eye, can see very deep, but also um, uh, it has wide, wide eyes so it can cover a large area. So we can actually tile that field very fast. That's why LSST is going to play a huge game, a huge role in this game of chasing after neutron star mergers in our universe. All right, so uh, third way. Uh, let's, let's get two black holes colliding. And two black holes will produce also a black hole. That's the other way to produce uh, a black hole in nature. And I'm sure you have heard a couple of years ago, well, but now three years ago, uh, the announcement of the first detection of gravitational waves from two black holes colliding. Here is in, an, in animation. This is not how things look like in reality. Uh, the black dots are the black holes, and you can see them because they, they produce the distortion in the, uh, in the light of objects around. And again, they can't stay there. Why? Because they're losing energy through uh, the gravitational waves, uh, wave emission, and what they produce is a black hole. Okay. 
So while for two neutron stars, uh, we have seen some light, in the case of two black holes collisions, we have never seen any light coming out. So LSST uh, will enable uh, the deepest search. It's literally the frontier of research right now. Okay, so we made two black holes collide, we made two neutron stars collide, guess what? Let's take a black hole and a neutron star, and they also produce a black hole. Uh, just, like, uh, just like for black hole, black hole mergers have never been observed. And uh, actually, um, uh, this is something I'd like to share with you. I am here with no sleep at all. Why? Because last night we had one of these events. And if any of you is interested to, to get uh, updates about what's going on in the universe, there is a beautiful LIGO app, and you can uh, receive alerts at any possible time of day and night. <laughs> Uh, about uh, when a new black hole merger happened, a neutron star merger happened, and you can see in real time what we are doing. But bottom line, this is what I did last night. Uh, this is, uh, we uh, received this map. This is a map of the sky that tells us that here, uh, somewhere here, something interesting happened, in this case, a neutron star black hole merger. And after a while, uh, the gravitational wave people were able to refine the localization, and they were able to tell us, yeah, look here, it's better. And um, right now, my team uh, is uh, going through all the images and trying to understand if something new uh, um, um, was born. So stay tuned. All right, uh, so uh, let's, uh, let's circle back to the big black holes. So uh, Ferial was telling us about the very big supermassive black hole that sits deep down uh, in M87, and uh, this is a black hole that is kind of nice to us because it makes its presence very obvious uh, because it's producing this jet. However, not every big black hole is that nice. And there is a huge population of supermassive black holes that, are, that sit, sit there quietly in their galaxies. They don't do anything. We call them dormant black holes. And uh, if nothing happens, we have no way to tell that a black hole is there. But in the recent years, we developed this technique. So we built on bad luck. On the bad luck of a star that just happens to wander too closely to the, to the black hole. So here you don't see anything, this is the black hole, and here is the poor star uh, that gets too close, it gets ripped apart, and half of its mass go and feed the black hole. So the black hole that was dormant until that point wakes up and produces a jet, one of those, uh, one jet just like the M87 one. And after a while, uh, the matter uh, from, the, from the star is over and the jet so shuts off. So this is an artistic impression. Things look this nice only uh, when they are not real. But uh, look at, this is reality, how things look like. So what we saw is this flare of x-rays. So nothing was there before, a huge flare of x-rays and gone forever. And here is the point where, okay, here the star gets accreted, we produce a lot of energy, and at this point the jet, the jet shuts off. Equal, the black hole has eaten up all the mass, that's it. So he, we have to wait for another star to go, to go through. So where does LSST come to do the game here? Well, uh, this, uh, this type of event are rare, thankfully for stars, uh, they are rare, which means that if I want to learn about uh, these dormant black holes, I have to monitor a huge number of galaxies. And this is again where the big eyes of LSST are gonna make the difference. They're gonna tell us, hey, look there, because right there, something is new. So this black hole just uh, is, now, um, is now alive. Okay, so this is the end of my little tour into the life of black holes, but uh, as somebody said, the end is just where we start. And uh, at this point, I think uh, I'm happy to take questions, and I would invite the other two speakers uh, to the podium as well. Thank you so much.